Welcome to the C3AI Digital Transformation Institute Colloquia. Our mission is to attract the world's leading scientists to join in a coordinated and innovative effort to advance the digital transformation of business, government, and society. As you can see, we are a consortium of many different strong universities and companies, and we have been growing, in fact. Over the next weeks, there will be several very interesting colloquia coming up. And you can see this list beginning with next week with Diwakar Shukla, then Christian Borgs, Nathan Schrebo, Stefano Parasco and Karina Tarnita, Stefano Suato, Jeff Shama, Louis Shaw, and so forth. Our past presentations can be found on YouTube and encourage you to go see them. They're posted shortly after the colloquium is over. Today's format is as usual, except with a few modifications, which I'll tell you in a minute. There will be a 40 minute presentation. Uh, there will be Q and A, but the Q and A will be throughout the talk. So it's not 40 minutes followed by Q and A. Please do submit questions in the Q and A and we will be answering, or Matus will be answering them during his presentation. You can upvote a question that you like, uh, even if you haven't submitted it yourself. And as many questions as possible will be answered. So the title today is Recent Advances in the Analysis of the Implicit Bias of Gradient Descent on Deep Networks. Our speaker is Matus Talgarski, who's one of my colleagues at the University of Illinois. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science. He specializes in deep learning theory. He received his diploma in violin performance from Juilliard and then a PhD from UC San Diego under Sanjoy Dasgupta. He received his NSF Career Award in 2018 on Theoretical Foundations of Neural Networks. He co-founded the Midwest Machine Learning Symposium in 2017, and he organized or co-organized a Simons Institute Summer 2019 program on deep learning with several of distinguished people. So I'm very pleased that Matus is giving this talk today. He's been a great friend. Uh, before we actually had our shutdown, we were hanging out together relatively frequently. So with that, I will turn it over to Matus. Okay, thanks very much for inviting me and for introducing me. And at this point, you should uh, she might see my shared screen. Um, and as Tandy said, I'll be answering questions throughout. I have the Q&A window open in front of me. So yeah, today's talk is about the, the core eventual goal of this line of work, which hopefully we get to within, I don't know, 10 years, is uh, to do a better job explaining why deep networks generalize. And as in the title of the talk, the particular angle is uh, this notion implicit, uh, implicit bias or implicit regularization, which I'll explain uh, multiple times throughout the talk, but I will define all these terms. And everything I'm presenting today is joint work with my friend Zue G. Zue G is a PhD student at University of Illinois graduating next year. And not only did he contribute many of the key technical parts and technical ideas, but we worked very closely in all of this and many of the high level intuitions and just the philosophy and many aspects of the work are, are due to Zue. So, okay, so there will be it's based on basically three papers and they're all with, or actually at this, I guess, four, five, and they're all with Zue. Okay, so the high level goal of, of this line of work, which, like I said, we're not actually going to directly address today is we would like to explain why deep networks can get a very low test error. So here I'm using the classical model where data is drawn ID from some distribution. And in, in, in the future, I want to work well in expectation over that same distribution. So this is just a standard notation. This is called the population or distribution risk. Here, my expected loss is supposed to be small. I'm doing binary classification for today. And my predictor here, F, this predictor F is a standard deep network, the architectures I'll be able to handle in today's talk will generally have this form. This is a kind of the, the simplest type of deep, of deep network where you take in an input X, you hit it with a, a non with your uh, linear transformation, then you hit it with your first nonlinearity, and then you just keep iterating this construction. So that's just what I've uh, found there. So those are our predictors for today. And our goal is small test error. So the standard way that people analyze this, and that's been just sort of the way it's been broken down 
almost forever, it feels like for, I don't know, I guess, uh, I guess 50 years, this has been essentially the, the basic decomposition is we break it into two problems. One is an optimization problem where we have a finite training set we've sampled this distribution and we want what's called the empirical risk here to be small. So this is data we observe, we try to do well on that. And then we hope that we still do well on the original distribution. So the only thing we can ensure is that we're small on the data we did see, and we hope that we're good on the data we did not see. So this, like I said, is, is decades old and, and the, the mathematical technology to ensure especially this component is very, very old. Now, a disastrous fact is that the bounds that try to ensure this, so the bounds that try to ensure that you do well in expectation of the distribution, with res or that the behavior on the distribution is similar to the behavior on the data you saw, the bounds that try to ensure this are just disastrously loose. And what do I mean by disastrously loose? I, if, 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 uh, if somebody in the audience has not actually computed these themselves, then it's, it's instructive if I, if I tell you. So what the theory says is the gap between these looks sort of like order one over n, all, in, all within a square root. And the order one, the question is, how bad is that? So what actually happens if you compute these bounds these days on a standard modern network, this bound ends up being something like 10 to the 10, at least. It's 10 to the 10 if you use the best bounds. It's larger if you use good ones. And to be clear, this is a quantity that you want to look more like one over root n. So you want it to look more like one over 300 or something. So the situation is an absolute disaster. We do not have even remotely ballpark a good explanation on why these things generalize. And many people are very frustrated and excited about this situation. I mean, the frustration leads to excitement when you think you have a good way to analyze it. And many people are working in many different angles. And one angle, which is what this talk is actually about, is a specific optimization angle. So the classical perspective on optimization is you just solve this problem, this training error problem, in any way you want. It doesn't matter. You just make that number small. And then you separately ensure that that implies you do well over the distribution itself. And a perspective which has existed in parallel with all of this, a perspective that's existed actually since the 60s, but now is, is actually taking quite a bit of prominence. So many groups around the world are working on this perspective is the perspective which is called implicit bias, which is that the optimization algorithm actually prefers specific solutions. In particular, if there are many solutions, it picks very nice ones, and those nice ones have good generalization properties. So again, this is an optimization talk but the eventual goal of this many years down the line is a good generalization analysis. So what today's talk is about is about this property of gradient descent on deep networks that it happens to choose what seem to be simplistic or not, uh, well, what is simple mean? So it happens to choose deep networks that happen to have good generalization properties. And I'm being very vague here because many people say that, deep, that optimiz this optimization chooses simple networks, but in fact, there are certain networks it chooses that are uh, seem not simple, but actually they do generalize well. So but that's the goal. So today's talk is about optimization and um, yeah, hopefully down the line we can show that they generalize well. And just to give you a, a little picture before I give you the outline for the talk of, of what this means and how this contrasts with the classical view. So for those of you that, especially those of you that learned machine learning when I did or, or, or before that, um, we were all kind of kind of, uh, you know, we received many, many lectures about something called the SVM, the support vector machine. And the support vector machine is, is a optim it, its optimization problem as a unique solution. And you set up the optimization problem so that you, you bias it to prefer different solutions. So here I've drawn, this is the same data set in all three pictures. And by tweaking the knobs on the, on the SVM, I can get it to pick three different solutions. But even though they're different solutions, they all have one kind of nice trait, which is if you look, it's hard to see in this figure, but if you, if you track where the zero contour is in these plots, so the decision boundary, it's different colors in each of them, sorry about that. But if you look at where the decision boundary is, it always seems to be pretty well separated from most of the data. And this is a, this is a design property of the SVM optimization problem that explicitly tries to enforce that you have a bit of separation between the decision boundary and the, and the, and the uh, data points. Meanwhile, 
When we train deep networks, we do not use the SVM optimization palm or anything like it. We just run gradient descent, typically with no regularizers on cross entropy loss or something like the cross entropy loss. And there's no reason to believe it should pick, I mean, there's no reason to believe, well, certainly none of the classical textbooks say there's any reason to believe that the boundaries have these nice margin properties. But if you run the experiment, you just run gradient descent with the standard modern setup. Indeed, it picks these nice decision boundaries that are very clean. You know, it, it could have picked some wacky thing, right? Because a great, a, a deep network can certainly represent such functions, but it doesn't pick a wacky thing. It picks this really nice, like almost smooth looking contours that are that have good margins. So that's what this talk is about. This talk is, you know, this is just some experiment I ran on this data. This talk is trying to understand uh, this phenomenon. And to be clear, uh, have we fully analyzed it? No, not even remotely. Has anyone else? No. And do I believe that this is the only way to analyze generalization for these deck networks? No. And is it possible that this does not fully answer the generalization question even 10 years down the line? Yeah, that's also true. There are many ways that generalization could play out, but this is the one that I will tell you about today. Okay, so that's the setup for the talk. Um, I will cover basically three different topics uh, in some level of depth based on essentially time. The first one is I will introduce this implicit bias idea in the linear case, the case of linear predictors, no nonlinearities. And um, already there, there's a lot of beautiful, there are a lot of beautiful things that can be said and a lot of beautiful things that have not been analyzed yet. So, and we have the best theorems in the linear case that I hope we can carry over to other cases. So sometimes I debate not, to, not presenting the linear case, but yeah, I want to present the linear case. And then I will talk about two deep learning cases. The first one, so item two here, just for the people that are familiar with the terminology, this is in what's called the neural tangent kernel or NTK regime. For people that are not familiar with the terminology, the NTK captures behavior of deep networks at the very beginning of gradient descent. You run a couple gradient descent iterations. They happen to be well explained by this thing called the neural tangent kernel. Unfortunately, you run a couple more iterations. Sometimes even just one suffices. So only like the first two iterations of gradient descent are uh, you, you exit this NTK regime. But early on, it, it happens to explain it very well, and it also has very many different ways to analyze it. They're all clean. That's the uh, second part of the talk. I'll talk, I'll talk about a perspective on the neural tangent kernel that uses the implicit bias. And then the last part of the talk, I will be outside the neural tangent kernel. I'll be talking about just general optimization of multi layer networks. Of course, you know, as, this, as the arrow goes down here, the results get weaker. But you know, we try our best. And hopefully, uh, you know, people can build on this last part. So, any questions before we move on? I hope the setup is clean and the scope is clean. <clears throat> okay, and I, like I said, I have the Q and A open in front of me, so feel free to uh, post questions on that throughout. Okay, so for people that are not familiar with this idea of implicit bias, it's very easy to exhibit it visually and it's just a very clear phenomenon so let me let me show you how it looks in the linear case with linearly separable data the cleanest setup for this problem so my data is binary it's two point clouds that are well separated the origin is here and linearly se linearly separable means that there are many different hyperplanes well there are hyperplanes to the origin that separate the data, meaning the pluses are on one side, the minuses are on the other side. And note that there are many different hyperplanes I could choose that separate the data. The separating hyperplane, there is no, it's not a unique optimization problem by itself. There are so many different ones. And so you can ask yourself, which one would gradient descent choose? And to be clear, I've written out the formal optimization problem here. This, what I've just circled is gradient descent. And what I just put in the box is the empirical risk I'm optimizing. This is called a logistic loss. All the losses I consider in this talk have this form, and I've baked in the linear predictors here. So my prediction before was y f x. Now it's just y x transpose w. Okay, and w is my optimization variable. Okay, so there are all these different solutions we could pick. If I run gradient descent, what does it do? Well, oh, and just to be clear, what is the max margin? Well, for this particular problem, the, the maximum margin direction is this one. Okay. So if you run gradient descent, it very obviously follows 
the maximum margin direction. Even, you know, I, I initialized it off the origin because it might have seemed pathological if it did it from the origin, but it even zeroes off this orthogonal component. So it, it really follows the, the max margin direction. So um, the phenomenon is very clear empirically. And this fact was, um, this fact was sort of, I would say, popularized and first sort of introduced in the deep learning literature in, in the work of, um, so there are many authors on this paper. Uh, so this is Daniel Sodri. There's also Siri Gunasekar and, and Nati Srebro. Nati is actually talking in the seminar in two weeks. And based on his abstract, he might be talking about similar things, but um, I think the specific results are talking about it differently or different. And this actually has a long history. I, so this paper gave rates by, by Nati and, and Daniel Sodri. And, and uh, rates were proved by me when I was a grad student for coordinate descent. And I should say that um, before that, there's a work by Zhang and Yu from 20, 2004, which proved that coordinate descent just period asymptotically achieves max margins. So that was, that was before what I did. And this, just to be clear, this U here is, is Bin Yu in the stats department at, at Berkeley. Okay, so this is, and, and there's a long line of papers that, that went before this too. Okay, so this is the phenomenon. And um, the only, so, so it's a very clear phenomenon. And, and for those of you that have not seen the definition of a max margin predictor before, here's the definition of the max margin predictor in the linear case. So I look over unit norm predictors and the definition of the margin is, uh, you know, I, I take my predictor and I just project, I just project the data onto the onto the predictor, and I look at the closest the closest project the closest projection. That's what this min here does, and I search over all unit norm predictors and I take the, the linear predictor that has a, a unit norm that has the that maximizes this minimum that maximizes this uh, margin over the over the training set. Okay, so all this expression here is saying with a bunch of fancy notation is we run gradient descent, something like the logistic loss, asymptotically converges to this. Uh, and so for me, the, the amazing fact about this, which you cannot find in you know, any of the textbooks any of us are teaching our classes from, is that this is the same solution as the hard margin SVM. You know, it's funny for me, I teach, one of the undergrad class I teach is just regular machine learning, and according to our syllabus, I have some lectures on SVM and some lectures on logistic regression. And in all the textbooks, they treat them like fully unrelated things. But here I'm telling you the hard margin SVM and logistic regression take the same solution. In fact, um, so the paper that I'm highlighting for this part of the talk is uh, here's a rate that Zui and I proved. So I should, and I should just say, what are the conditions in this theorem? So the data is linearly separable. And that's the only condition. So um, the rate, the rate at which you maximize the margin is one over T. The reason I'm highlighting that is, you know, some people that maybe are not familiar with this literature or, um, don't like this line of work. If you're in the audience and you don't like, like this line of work, thanks for having you know, attended, even though you don't like the line of work. Many of you might be saying, well, still in the end, who cares? Because if I don't care about logistic loss, why, why does this matter to me? Why don't I just run the SVM solver? Well, guess what? Um, this convergence rate for the hard margin problem is faster than any convergence rate published for any hard margin SVM solver as far as I know. I mean, I haven't read all 50,000 papers, but it seems to be the fastest. Um, you can just check for yourself because the margin problem is non-smooth. It seems you get a one over root T rate. So uh, the fact that it's the fastest, it doesn't really matter to me. I mostly say it to, to highlight that it, it, there's something interesting happening here. Uh, we, we were not trying to make a fast, the fastest solver. We were just trying to analyze this problem. Um, and I will also say that there's an interesting thing in the proof technique, which relates to the title of this talk, which is that, okay, so there's the SVM, which based on its us, on optimization problem, it's an explicit margin maximizer. Then there's logistic regression, which doesn't explicitly seem to have margin maximization in it. So that's why it's called an implicit bias. The algorithm implicitly prefers max margin solutions. However, our proof technique 
reveals that the dual problem to what logistic regression is solving, a, a certain dual, you have to do a little transformation, but a certain dual that it's optimizing is an explicit margin maximization problem. So there's a, you know, maybe in a couple of years when we talk about this, we'll actually call it explicit margin maximization because, because of this dual, this dual perspective. And this, the proof we use, this is a newer proof. We worked on this problem also years ago, but this, this new proof uses this dual approach. And I can just say, um, oh, I see a question. I'll answer this question just after I finish this slide. After this slide, this, this is the only slide I have for the linear case. Um, many of you might still say, okay, still, if this, if this is intrinsically what logistic regression is doing, if this is why it generalizes well, then still, why don't I just use a different max margin sol solver? And another way to look at it is, is the max margin property why logistic regression does well? Let me just explain. If you look in standard machine learning textbooks, they say a lot of this stuff works for any convex loss. In practice, people pretty much only use cross entropy and logistic loss. Why? Like, why do people only use one loss? I wish I could answer that question. And I don't claim that this is why, that this, is, that this theorem is why uh, the logistic loss is, is so widely used. So there might be other reasons and other implicit biases for why, why the logistic loss is so powerful. And I can't, uh, I don't know. Okay, let me answer this. Let me answer this question. So does this result also hold for SGD? So the answer is no. Um, there are different versions of SGD. There's SGD where you do it over um, a finite training set, and then there's SGD where you draw from the distribution. And the answer is no. If you use SGD, you can prove a, a constant margin. Um, there, there, there's a proof technique we have that gives you a so this converges to the max margin solution. We can prove with SGD that you get to a constant multiple of the, mul of the margin with a different proof technique than in these papers. These papers that get the maximum margin, the proof technique is always feels a little bit magical to me. Like there's a cancellation in you just to get that coefficient one. But yeah, if you want to get a one half, then, then um, yeah, there's a technique and, and uh, actually the paper that has this cleanest, if you want, if you want an explicit reference is Ohad Shamir wrote this up very nicely. He has a paper titled, um, I think it's titled Gradient Descent Never Overfits. If I remember correctly, he uses a version of one of, he uses, um, it's related to one of our older analyses and it, and it, uh, and it, can, it can get a factor of two, can get a factor of two. Okay, good question. Yeah, it's, and I shall, yeah, it's a, that was a good question. And for people in the audience that, um, oh, there's another question. Let me get this one correct. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so th this question is very interesting. So um, let me give myself a little bit of space. So if the max margin direction looks like this, it's not necessarily true. So if, if this is the max margin direction, the gradient descent direction can actually have a bit of drift. It can go kind of in this direction at a rate of t and in this direction at a rate of log t. If you take the ratio, if you look at the actual direction after you normalize it, it's still pointing in the max margin direction, but it can have this log t drift term. And um, so in the original paper that I mentioned by Sodri et al from, from 2017, they actually explicitly gave this, uh, this, log, t, this log t component. And um, we did not, uh, we did not give that exact characterization here. That log t component is still there, but we use a different proof technique, which, um, which, uh, which, which doesn't explicitly handle that log t term. So to be clear like that, that component is still there. It's just, um, yeah, it's swallowed in this analysis. So we don't have that exact characterization you mentioned. I should also mention that paper gets a log t rate. So it's convergence rate is one over log t and and i i i don't know i don't know if people have carried i haven't thought through if that proof technique works at these faster rates which also use larger step sizes okay good questions um thank you i love questions so thank you very much for answering asking these very detailed and very nice questions yeah, that form in this study paper is really cool and really clean. And uh, it hasn't appeared in, in later papers, as far as I know, the faster rates.
Okay, so now I want to talk about um, applications to deep networks. Uh, let me just look at the clock and decide how I want to divide my time. So like I said, this, this part of the talk is in what's called the NTK, which for just to remind the people that are less familiar with this term, that is a, I would say, characterization of the early phase of gradient descent. And it's a very nice characterization. It, it's, um, even though it looks like it vastly simplifies the problem, it does accurately track the behavior of gradient descent at the beginning of, of gradient descent. But then, but then it splits off. And in practice, it, in my experience, in practice, people are outside the NTK regime in, in general. But that's just my experience, and there are an infinite number of experiments going on at all times. The second, th then this last part will be something beyond the NT, outside the NTK, but the results will be much weaker. So the results we have, though, I'm very pleased with them, and it's what I want to spend more time on. They will, the theorems will look lamer to uh, to all of you than, than the theorems in this part. Okay, but the proofs are harder. So, <laughs> okay, um, so that, that's what I want to talk about, and I will. I think I will talk about this part less because, because there are many talks that people give on the NTK. And even though our analysis is different, it, it might um there's there's like less there's like less newness here. Um, but everybody should feel free to ask me questions about this part. Don't don't take my speed to indicate that I'm not interested in. I actually really like this part, but it's um yeah, I just want to put some more. Okay. And thanks again for the two questions we had so far. Okay, so let me tell you the setup for this part. Um, so the setup for this part is, yeah, so the, the setup for this part is how a lot of the original NTK papers looked. They just studied a single layer network. And I, I'll discuss briefly extensions to, to deeper networks. But so I like this setup a lot. It's kind of the simplest non con or in my to my taste, it's the simplest non-convex problem with deep network with, with, with neural networks you, you can analyze. So um, going back to my setup from before, I have my inner weights, then I have my nonlinearity, which is the ReLU. I don't know why I didn't define it. For those of you that haven't seen it, the ReLU, which uh, just to be absolutely clear, was introduced prominently in the neural network literature in, as far as I know, the 70s by uh, Fukushima. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the ReLU, and it's the standard uh, ActiveH people use now. So in this setup, we only have, we're only training these. They're initialized with random Gaussian values, and we, we only train these. And these S's are fixed. Okay, so these are fixed, and these are trained. And I like this setup a lot because since you're training the inner layer, the innermost layer, the problem is non-convex and non-trivial. So this is kind of like uh, a very simple step up from the linear case that already captures some of the non-trivial components of analyzing deep networks. Of course, there are many other non-trivial aspects of analyzing optimization for deep networks, but this setup captures some of them very cleanly. So I, uh, yeah, I, 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 find this, I find this very interesting. Now, some of the, some of the theorems I'm gonna show you for this part have been extended beyond this setting and some of them, some of them have not. Okay, so what is our goal here? Um, so just, like I was saying, in this part, we will do an NTK-like analysis. Now, what contrasts our analysis with others, I'll say these in reverse order, is that unlike the other NTK analyses, we actually use the notion of implicit bias within our proof. Now, this might sound a little bit contradictory because earlier I made it look like the implicit bias is an asymptotic thing. You eventually converge to this. But for this part, we are actually using this implicit bias throughout. We're using it to guide the optimization process throughout. And what we will get is that, um, oh, I should also say, well, another property that I didn't list here is that our, our convergence rate will depend on this implicit bias. So if, if there's like a larger margin solution, then our convergence rate is better. Um, and the main thing that distinguishes our analysis from others is that standard analyses, the width of the network is polynomial in the number of samples. The best people have is, is linear in the number of sample, data samples, whereas we only have a, a logarithmic dependence on the number of samples. And to my taste, this is actually a bit important because not only is our width data dependent, the minimum width we need data dependent, but also even though modern networks are large, their width is never large. Their width is like in the hundreds or something at most. 
in my way. Is that true? Yeah, I think the width, probably, I guess wide ResNet is somewhere in like in the small thousands, but still not the number of data points. Okay, and the other thing I like is that we do have an example where our, so we will give a test error bound in this part of the talk, and we have an example where our test error upper bound matches a lower bound. So the upper bound is general, but, and then for a specific data example, actually a data example due to uh, Tongi Ma and, and Colin Wei, um, it's, it's matching. So we're, we're very pleased with this. And actually part of the reason we analyzed the specific setting in this paper is so that we could get this tight sample complexity. Actually, I'm, I'm quoting Zoe here. Zoe always reminds me that I have to stress this. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. So that's what we will show. Um, yeah, okay, so I, I think I can show a bit of the detail. So for the peop for people that are not familiar with the NTK setup, let me say it in words before I flash the definition. The NTK is based on a very, just very natural, very natural perspective that leads to a very easy, or that simplifies the analysis a lot. So the perspective is near to initialization, despite having all these like weird nonlinearities and complicated networks, because what I'm gonna say holds not just in the shallow case. The, the perspective is that if you just take the Taylor expansion of the network at initialization, so the Taylor expansion of its predictions at initialization, then essentially by Taylor's theorem, for the beginning of gradient descent, before you move too far, uh, you will you will well capture what's going on with this Taylor expansion. And even though this, you know, how, how accurate can this be? A beautiful thing about this that I didn't mention is that the NTK idea, which um, I should say appeared in parallel in a number of works, one was by, uh, oh no, I forgot all the authors. So oh, this is terrible, I forgot all the authors. Maybe somebody can, can post it as a question so everybody can see. So this is, I, I forgot one of the authors. Another one is, um, yeah, oh, I forgot one of the authors. Yeah, if, if somebody could abuse the QA to post, I, I just, it's, it's, there's three authors and I forgot one of their names. Yeah, oh God, okay, thank you so much. I got I got cursed by the et al, you see what happened to me? I got abused by the et al. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, so it was it was introduced in parallel. Um, there, there was also, so I think Simon Du, well, okay. Yeah, there, so there are a lot of papers that came out near each other that, that had these ideas. Okay, so again, the idea is Taylor expansion near initialization, and a very nice property of it is not just that it analyzes, it tracks what happens at the beginning, but one of the most perplexing things, especially if, let's say a decade ago about deep networks was as you increase their width, if you, as you increase their size, basically everything about them gets better. They train faster, they generalize better. And this seems contradictory with like basically everything we had. I mean, it, it actually isn't, but um, it's contradictory certain with some of the things we had. Uh, and we definitely didn't have a nice way to characterize it. And in this NTK analysis, I won't go into it here, but in this NTK analysis, it actually captures this. So if you make the network larger, it um, it doesn't blow anything up. And actually in, in, our, in our bounds, the bounds I'm gonna show you, they don't get any worse if you make the network larger. I'll give the minimum width. It's I'll say it's polylog, but um, if you make it that times you know 50 million, the bound still works. So okay, too much rambling. Let me let me get back to the program. So here it is. I'll I'll try to be clean for the rest of this part. So got a little excited. Thanks for the person that reminded me about Gabriel. So here it is. In math, I've just written out Taylor expansion. F was my predictor. I wrote it up here. And here I've just written out for you the uh, gradient, right? I've just pretended that uh, at zero, I just choose, you know, I just choose some selection of the subgradient at, at zero. Okay, I don't really worry. In, in this proof, it actually, the non-differentially doesn't matter for, for, a, very, yeah, for a very, very simple reason. Okay, so this is the, this is the, the formal definition you can, and this upper part works, of course, for other architectures. I've just written it out here for, for, for the simplified part. Um, now, the an interesting thing about this is that if I write down what looks like an infinite width network, so let me explain what this is. So here, because I have infinite many weights, instead of a sum, I'm writing it as an integral. 
I have a Gaussian measure here over weights. And what I do for each of these weights is this part of the expression is like in the finite width one. What's different now is I'm indexing my weights not by this finite index from one to m. I'm indexing the weights by every, you know, every element in R to D, all these, all these Gaussian random vectors. And this calligraphic W, what it's doing is it's taking in a weight and mapping it somewhere else. Okay, so if, if you look at this, this one over here, similarly, I, for every index J, I'm basically taking weight at time zero, which is what this notation here means, and I'm mapping it to some other location. Maybe I should have written a T in the notation. So that's what this is saying. It's saying for all the weights in this Gaussian measure, push them somewhere else. This is an infinite width network. Now, a pretty cool thing you can do is you can just take everything we know from concentration inequalities and all those aspects, all those sides of statistics, and we can sample from this. We can sample from this, and if you, if you sample from it, you get a finite width network, and indeed, it'll concentrate. So, so that's kind of uh, one way to see that this already captures this, this large width thing in, in a nice way. And we will use this infinite width perspective in, in our analysis. So the large margin or the implicit bias that we have in this. So I will actually not explain this in full detail. I'll just flash the slide for people that want to read it. But let me just say in words what's going on here. As, as I had it before, this is just a linear, this is just a fancy linear predictor. By taking the Taylor expansion, it's now a linear function in the parameters. So this is a fancy linear predictor in some fancy infinite dimensional space. And I make my margin assumption over that. So first part of the talk was linear predictors and a margin assumption over them, mar a separability assumption over them. Now I just have this infinite dimensional fancy linear predictor with these fancy features. And I make a margin assumption over that. It's really just the direct translation of, of the part before. Even, even this assumption is a direct translation. And this is due to Natanda and Suzuki, who are doing very well. They just uh, won an ICLR Best Paper Award a couple of days ago, I guess that was announced. OK, so that's our assumption. It's just a natural analog to the NTK setting of, of what we did in a linear part. And I won't say too much about it, but it has many nice properties. It's, it's actually a um, it's still a universal approximator, so it's not, not really an assumption. OK, so what's the theorem we get? So the theorem we get is that um, if you have a width, which is at least some polynomial in uh, that margin parameter, so what's hiding in the tilde here is things like log n and log 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is your desired test error. So the width is poly in 1 over gamma. The number of samples we need is poly in 1 over gamma, the margin, and 1 over epsilon squared, where eps, epsilon squared is our desired test error. And the number of iterations, this is number of samples. And so this one here is optimization iterations. So I, I didn't say this in the slide before, but another notable thing about this is that the amount of training we have to do also scales. It's a data dependent. It also scales with how good the margins are. So many other NTK analyses, the, the bound here is just, you know, you have to run some poly n type iterations. But here, uh, it's only poly log in n, and uh, it's poly 1 over gamma squared. And you can prove that the test error, if you do this, is less than epsilon. And yeah, I should say that the width, it really is an omega tilde, so you can make it, you know, you can make it n to the n if you want, <laughs> and, the, and it'll, it'll, the proof still goes through. Like the, the bound really is, uh, this is just the lower bound. Um, and I guess the, I've said everything I want to about this. Um, Chuan Chen Gu and his colleagues have, have carried it over to the uh, multilayer case, though they lost the, the, the tightness. Um, oh, and I should say, yeah, the, the way to get the tight example is you actually need to use our SGD proof. And our SGD proof um, just shaves, off some, shaves off some terms. Matish, I have, I have two questions. Um, Great. If you go to the previous slide. Yeah. So is it at all possible to relax the margin condition in, by a, in a probabilistic manner? Let's say the probability with which the margin is greater than or equal to gamma is greater than one minus delta or something like that. So yes. Maybe, yes. Okay. There, there, are many, there are many ways to relax it. So one way to relax it was actually in, uh, they have one relaxation in their paper. Um, and actually working right now. 
of an hour before the talk on another relaxation of it. Sorry, you got cut off for a second. Can you repeat what you said? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that not only do they have one. Oh, I have a little. Uh, I got a little Zoom notification that my connection's unstable. So worst case, I'll turn off my video. Maybe just tell me if it happens again. Uh, it just happened just for a second, so you can continue. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. So um, they have one relaxation. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other possible relaxations, and I'm literally working on one. I was working on it this morning, in fact. So there are, I think there are many. The one that I chose to work on today was, uh, yeah, there are many ways to do it, but published, this is the only one that's published. Okay. And then the uh, the second question is, uh, if I understood also looking at your paper, not just this, uh, this slide. So T is O tilde one over epsilon uh, gamma square. That's correct. So, so, so basically there is sort of in the analysis uses a, in some sense an explicit regularization too, right? In the sense that you're stopping the algorithm after a certain amount of time to make sure that W doesn't go straight too far from W zero. Yes. So, so yeah, so I just, I, I want to know if you have any comments on that. Yes, I do. So this point is um, here. So all NTK proofs, even if they don't, um, well, with one exception, essentially, almost every NTK proof has to stop early because the way the proof works is you need to ensure that you stay close to initialization so that your Taylor expansion stays good. And the proof works as long as the Taylor expansion is good. There actually is one setting, at least one setting, where you guarantee that you stay close to initialization in some sense forever. That's in the paper by um, Chazat and Bach. They, they, they prove that you actually stay within the NTK regime for a certain network architecture using the squared loss. Um, but in our settings, we, we do exit. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so we have that here uh, because we can exit the NTK, but, um, and, and this is common in many, yeah. Okay, thanks. This point of actually staying within the NTK though is quite interesting. There, I, experimentally, I think I found a couple of other settings where, where you stay within the NTK, but I have not been able, I have not been successful proving that you, you stay within it. But yeah, the paper by Chazat and Bach on lazy differentiable training, uh, it, it um, explicitly prove for one setting that you stay within the NTK. But I mean, was... but, but if, if there is such a result, then then uh, I, I mean, one way to interpret it is that as long as you're staying within the NTK regime, but but another way to interpret it is that if you do early stopping, meaning you stop the algorithm for a certain amount of time and you don't let the W stray too far, then you get reasonable generalization error. So, what, so can you comment on why you think that uh, 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 you said that you have to move beyond NTK, but this result seems to indicate that, I mean, if you stop yeah, at a certain yeah. time, you get good generalization. Uh, this is actually a really nice point. So I mentioned that there was an example where the um, where the sample complexity is due epsilon squared and that's tight. The lower bound is a lower bound over all kernel methods. And I won't go into the technicalities, but, but what we're analyzing here is essentially a kernel method. Um, if you exit the NTK, so, so just to be clear, we we prove upper and lower bounds that for a specific training problem, the one that was found by Colin Wei and Tommy Ma, we get upper and lower bound this sample complexity. Interestingly, you can also prove, well, we did not, um, actually no one has, but it seems that if you exit the NTK, it seems that you can get this. Ah, okay. And so our upper and lower bounds are for within the NTK regime. It seems that the outside the NTK Colin Wei and Tong Yuma, they do that they obtain this with a non-G with a non-gradient descent algorithm. And uh, Emmett Danielli analyzed a similar problem and got something similar. But um, yeah, I actually believe so. Yeah, I, I think the sample complexity can actually improve. Okay. But not thanks. always, but but yeah. Thanks. Cool. Okay, thanks for the excellent questions. Um, and as is typical of my self. I got too excited and got behind in this part. So for this part, um, what I will do is I will I will skip uh, the middle of this part. Um, but if you, uh, yeah, maybe you, you, you feel free to ask me about it afterwards. I think we will not have time to discuss it. But um, I'm just there, there's a part of this third part of the talk which is hard to interpret and um, yeah, that's basically why I'm not presenting. I will not present that part. So to be clear. So the first part, we talked about the linear case where we have the strongest results. And it's, I think, very easy to interpret or very 
very many nice ways to interpret this margin property. In the second part, I talked about what's, I guess, now a classical idea of the neural tangent kernel, but a different analysis for it, a different proof technique even, uh, that uses margins to get, uh, in some cases, better results. I should say that they're not across the board better. There are cases where bounds are actually worse, but there are cases where they're, they're really nice. Um, and then now I'll talk about stuff beyond the name TK. So I mentioned that in this part, our results are weaker. And the way I'm going, and our actual theorems, the talk, the paper that this part of the talk is based on, the theorems are, they, they look a bit technical, but the more time I spend with them, because I still don't fully understand them, the more they kind of, uh, the more I can kind of squeeze out of them. So I'm going to actually show you an example first to, which is just a corollary of these theorems, and then I will explain the theorems. So we will build up to general multilayer uh, fully connected networks, but first I will show you a simpler case. So what I'm doing in this part of the talk is for, for to be clear, just uh, like two, two slides. This is not, uh, not the theorem I'm building up to. Um, I'm rewriting a linear predictor in a way which is technically painful, but of course, in practice, completely nonsensical. So what I've done is I've taken my very happy and pristine W transpose X, you know, I mean, uh, you know, inner product, these are both elements of R to the D, and I've written it as a stack of matrices, okay? Another way to look at it is it's an L layer network, and I've just made all the activations identity, identity functions or just removed them, however you want to refer to it. So this is a perverse way of writing down a linear predictor. And it's painful because as an optimization problem, this is now a polynomial optimization problem, right? In, in, the, in the weights themselves, you work up that matrix product. This is an L degree polynomial. So this is, I mean, superficially, this is a very painful optimization problem. And so I've reparameterized the linear predictor. And I'm assuming what I did before, which is data is linearly separable. But two point clouds, and I've got this nice, well, I can't draw, separator radius mar, uh, gamma, okay, margin of, of margin gamma. Okay, so in this setting, you know, one thing uh, we could hope for, which, I mean, it, you know, it's time, not that much time has passed, like the first time I heard that such thing, I was just shocked, so so yeah, the first thing you could maybe hope for is that the um, that the induced linear predictor. Okay, so what I've done is I've written, I've multiplied all the matrices together, and I've divided them by the norm of their product. So this is this is the same. This is just this is just an, a, a you know a unit norm vector of R to the D. The thing you could hope for is that this induced linear predictor is actually the max margin of solution. So this is just the fancy way I had before of writing down. The max margin of solution. So you could hope that this complicated reparameterization, which has an L degree polynomial, um, that this complicated reparameterization doesn't really affect things. That gradient descent magically still chooses the max margin of solution. So you, you could hope for this. And if you had told me this four years ago, I would have told you, yeah, that's probably nonsense. Um, Magically, what you can actually prove is much stronger. So let me just show you the quick picture. Indeed, if you just plot that linear predictor, it still follows the max margin of direction. Again, what you can prove is much stronger. So, oh, and I, so what are the assumptions on this theorem? We, we actually studied this problem twice, but this stronger version that I've written here is a corollary of uh, this, this uh, NERVS paper that we have from 2020. So this just assumes linear, linear separability and just to be a little bit more technical, just to have all these assumptions here, we're also using the gradient flow, which is gradient descent with an infinitesimal step size. The only step size I know that works is a decreasing step size. So, I mean, yeah, let's just call it gradient flow. But those are the assumptions. And so what you can prove is the second part of what I just said we could hope for, which is this is the max margin direction. The induced linear form converges to the max margin direction. But the, so here's the, the cooler thing you can prove. And this relates to my original goal of showing that gradient descent prefers um, things that have some, some specific structure. You know, Because there are many different ways of writing down the max margin predictor with a stack of, stack of matrices, right? So I've got the stack of matrices. 
And one thing I could do is I could just pick, you know, let me just write it down in terms of the singular values. I could just make this be the last matrix this is W1. And then I just make these be all sorts of weird junk. It doesn't matter as long as it's, um, you know, identity. And so the miraculous thing is that gradient descent does prefer a specific structure for all of these. It doesn't just pick random large rank matrices. If you think about it, this thing is rank one. So why don't we just make this thing rank one? That cer certainly seems reasonable. The magic thing is gradient descent automatically does that. So again, we run gradient descent on the logistic loss from just some arbitrary initialization and, and it gets this solution. So what solution does it pick? All of these are rank one matrices. So the rank one and the singular vectors of adjacent layers are aligned. So if you look at the right singular vector of some layer and the left singular vector of the next layer, they're the same. I should say the way I've written this, there's like a plus minus one, um, but yeah, they're, 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 they're collinear. So yeah, asymptotically gradient descent prefers solutions that are, um, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the maximum solution and all the inter inter intermediate matrices are, are rank one with, with this aligned structure. So, I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is pretty amazing. And so we would like to prove something like this for deep networks. And we don't have it yet, but I'll show you what we do have. So I will skip the next slides. That's where I have the complicated and uninterpretable thing. You can email me about it later if you want. So we proved two theorems. We proved two theorems. Um, I'll uh, please leave that that question up. I'll answer it after I get through these two theorems. But yeah, please, uh, everybody involved, please please leave that question up. So we proved two theorems that, again, our eventual goal is to characterize what solutions gradient descent prefers. We don't have that, but what we have are two lemmas that are quite general. They hold quite generically, and while they're a little bit uninterpretable. Um, for instance, one thing they imply immediately, they apply what I just showed you just via linear algebra. You just combine the two, do a little bit of easy linear algebra, and you're done. They apply a two-layer result with the nonlinearity that I just skipped. It's in the paper. Um, and they also apply many other reasons. In, in, in fact, we, even though this is a semi-recent paper, people have already used these lemmas and theorems. We've, we've seen it in multiple um, papers that have been appearing on archive and stuff. People are using these to imply other stuff. Okay, so we proved two theorems that are like, uh, or rather like lemmas, they're like tools. And I will just tell you these and how to interpret them. I won't talk about the proofs. And then I'll go to questions just so that we make sure we're, we're sticking reasonably to time. Okay, so the first theorem is what I'll call an asymptotic, um, asymptotic local, local optimum of the margin objective. That's not a complete characterization of what it is, but it's the, it's the thing I can do in the amount of time I have. So this statement, let me just explain. Um, actually, I won't, I, won't, I won't give a more complicated explanation. I'll just say that this is, like I said here, earlier, earlier I mentioned that for the linear case, we get the global max margin solution. This thing, there's a way to interpret it as a critical point of the max margin objective. We wish we could prove, certainly if it was the max margin, the global max margin solution would be very nice, but now this only applies uh, for free that it's something like a critical point of the max margin objective. And um, yeah, the proof uses duality and, and that relates to the title of the talk too. And the other thing we proved is that the matrices converge in direction. Okay, so we, in fact, we proved that this tuple, so WT here, means all the parameters. You take all of these W1 through WL through W1 and you flatten it into a vector. And this thing converges in direction. And even though that seems very abstract, let me just tell you why this is somewhat interesting or what was known before. The only case that was known for the weights to converge, the only one that was known before was the linear case, not even the deep linear case, just the linear case. And even in the linear case, I did not know of an explicit proof. So the proofs that it converges in direction in the linear case were as a consequence of the global max margin property and the uniqueness of the max margin solution. I didn't know of direct proofs. And in a deep linear case, I did not know. And, um, and so, like I said, that deep linear theorem I gave you um, with the alignment and the max margin property in the deep linear case, 
that's just linear algebra on top of these two theorems. So yeah, that's what we have for this second part. Um, we have these two theorems that we hope to build from them, and we hope other people can build from them as they already are. Just to remind you, the first one was this directional convergence, and the other one was this uh, asymptotic critical point of the of the margin objective. And yeah, I mean, for free, these don't give any nice sample complex results and test error guarantees, but, but we hope to build up to that. So, and don't worry, I'm not ignoring the question. Let me just um, summarize what we talked about, and then I will answer the question, and we have to stick to time. So um, maybe we can just skip the part where you like thank me. And I can, <laughs> so, okay. So what we talked about today was this notion of implicit bias that gradient descent selects nice solutions. I'm not saying simple because what does simple mean? And I know that sometimes they're not simple. <laughs> so in the linear case, it, it asymptotic goes to max margin, margin solutions. And here we have quite a bit of understanding. Their convergence rate is fast and the pictures are clean. Um, in the shallow network case, in this NTK regime, we were able to use this, this concept of implicit bias to get, in some cases, a much nicer analysis than what, than what was before. Uh, and then in the deep case, we still do not have, I don't think anybody knows what the implicit bias actually is, even in, even in simple empirical cases, but um, we're building towards it. And in that part of the talk, I gave you kind of two tools, this, uh, this um, critical, this local maximum property and, or sorry, local critical point of margin objective property and this uh, directional convergence property. Okay, uh, let me answer this question. And that's all I have. So, uh, Oh yeah, so the question is very nice. So I, um, yeah, the question is very nice. The question is, um, the output is one dimensional. It's a binary classification problem. Uh, what happens for the multi multi-dimensional case? Well, for the multi-dimensional case, if we're actually going to get zero training error, we, we, we do need a, a higher rank one. And I actually proved, um, let me just try to remember which of the results. Some of our results go through in this. Um, I have not formally written down the, I have not formally written down the multi-class one for the deep linear case. Um, I think I worked it out once, um, but that's, that's, yeah, that's like it. Maybe, maybe write to me offline because I've actually been obsessed with multi-class lately. And so I think what I'm working on right now, I'm actually planning to include all the, all the, sometimes it's really hard to generalize to multi-class, sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes there are trivial reductions. Oh, that's right. We, okay, yeah, let me just let me just go to the next question. Um, maybe, maybe email me about that. But for now, just to be precise, formally, it does not seem to be in most of the papers. It seems the techniques sometimes have to change, but I think they might have an easy modification. Um, oh, so the question is, why, why does everybody why is there such a focus on convexity and concavity? I think it's just because that's where we have a lot of tools, but we do all hope to move beyond it. That's, uh, I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but we have a lot of tools there, basically. So Matus, thank you so much for this talk. Unfortunately, we're just at the end of our hour. Okay. Um, if anyone has questions they wanna follow up with Matus, you can send him an email. I think it's mjt at illinois.edu. Is that that's right? That's right. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, mjt at illinois.edu. Uh, this is one of the most wonderful talks, and I'm so glad to have gotten a chance to hear it. Shrikant, Thanks did you much. have anything you wanted to add? No, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks okay, for and thank you to all the people who came, and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.